me horny, me write song. <laughs> uh, despite that formula, they couldn't get a hit out, uh, other than through My Sharona. It was lightning in a bottle. <laughs> this horny song is the one that's going to make it. Uh, play Nirvana. The Cobain 50. Nirvana. Kurt Cobain's top 50 albums. Nirvana. From listener powered KEXP. <sighs> This is the Cobain 50 from Listener Powered KEXP. I'm Martin Douglas. And I'm Dusty Henry, welcoming you to our latest roundtable in our series. Joining us today is Albina Cabrera, host of El Sonido and the Cabanian podcast to this series, El Cantonero de Kurt. Hola amigos, how are you? Happy to be here again. Our audio engineer and producer for this series, Roddy Nickpour, who also wrote the episode on the knack. Hello. And our digital design manager, Janice Headley, who wrote the episode about Marine Girls. Hey, everyone. We've grouped these episodes together as Kurt Loves Melody. I mean, <laughs> I, I this has been the Cobain 50 of Muscle Power KEXP. That's all, folks. Uh, that was super <laughs> punk. Yeah. Great <laughs> round table, y'all. Yeah. The table is round, yes. <laughs> So yeah, we've been grouping episodes together and kind of talking about them in batches. And this one we have titled Kurt Loves Melody because of the melodic focus of the Knack, R.E.M. and Marine Girls. Yeah, which is an interesting um, contrast to maybe what of the surface level perceptions of Nirvana as this, you know, more aggressive sound and aesthetic. But you could dig into the melodies as well. Um, so I guess I'm gonna, let's start there. Um, you know, what do y'all think about this contrast uh, of Nirvana's aggressive grunge sound and the the picks of these albums on his list? I think that um, each pop culture icon has the mix between this like super wild uh, music and um, punk and all of that. But also I think that melodies or pop structures or basically <laughs> some of the albums that we are going to uh, talk about today, I think that is the perfect balance that I found in Kurt Cobain. And I think that that was the element, the reason why uh, Kurt Cobain was so huge and could reach so many different people, you know, listening different type of music. I don't know. I think that is a good balance. It was, being honest, hard for me, this episode specifically of El Cancionero de Court. But then it makes totally sense when you can listen to About a Girl. I don't know. Just an example of songs by Nirvana that you can find this balance. I feel like Nirvana does have a lot of melodies when you think about, like you said, about a girl. I don't know. I can't do it. But, you know, I, I can hear it in my head so vividly. I mean, come as you are, even just that lick is a melody. And, you know, I, I don't know. I Like, yes, yes to what Albina said. I'll come back to this. But somebody else. I mean, I would, um, I would venture to say that Kurt is probably just as well known for his sense of melody as he is for... The more aggressive music, the more, you know, powerful, throw himself into the drum set visceral sort of stuff that Nirvana does. I mean, for me personally, and I think for a lot of people, his most memorable songs are the ones with great melodies. Like we mentioned About a Girl several times, but also drain you heart shaped box all apologies like kurt is yeah one of the great melodic artists of you know our lifetime basically yeah i mean we've been talking a lot about his punk bona fides in the first half of this series but it's also got to remember like nirvana became a top 40 band yeah like a, mm -hmm. uh, they were a pop act at a certain point when they kind of crossed that threshold into the mainstream. And I think if he didn't have that melodic sense, there's, there's, you know, endless nameless wasn't going to go to number one. <laughs> right. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm curious to hear from you, Janice, you worked on the Marine girls episode. Uh, what kind of connections did you see with uh, Marine girls music and Nirvana? 
Yeah. I think that's something that's always kind of fascinated me about Kurt is that exactly like Nirvana is kind of known for being like more of an aggressive sound, but he also in his heart, he has, he has this like love for like twee indie pop music. And I thought it was really fascinating. Um, you know, Tracy Thorne, she tells this story about meeting Courtney Love. And it's actually, it's kind of told in two different ways. Um, in the, an essay she did for The Quietus, she says that Courtney approached her and said, Kurt has always wanted or always wanted to cover your song in love. But then in her book, in her memoir, she writes that Courtney says, my band Hole does a cover of your song in love. But Either way, whichever the story is, like, I'm dying to hear this cover, or I wish I could have heard Kurt's cover, because I want to hear, like, what they would do with that sort of, like, very stripped-down DIY sort of twee sound that Marine Girls have. And I think, you know, we see a hint of it in their covers of, like, Vaseline songs, because they kind of have, like, a similar sort of, like, sing-songy, indie pop sort of quality. And then Nirvana takes it and sort of, like, gives it a little bit of oomph, you know? And then they bring those influences into the original material that they write and you can like yeah you hear hints of it and in the most surprising ways i was gonna say like that's a good point because when nirvana covers a song they can give it the treatment either way it feels like like they can strip it down and really you know i'm thinking about the cover of david bowie for the unplugged set whereas like when they did cover uh my sharona for a minute (laughs) at a show in france one time it was as you said janice they injected kind of all the aggression of nirvana playing live but I don't know, it was like, it was like tight, but it's like the melody was there, but also like, it's just kind of like, they just play around with it. Like, even just the way Kurt sings it, that song in particular, it's just kind of like, he's not taking it that seriously. And what I also wanted to mention was that, because Dusty, you were saying earlier that like Nirvana is pop music, lest we forget. And um, we talked about this with Mud Honey earlier, but like, you know, how grunge uh, there's that montage we, we did earlier of like, you know, the grunge, like, what is the grunge? You know, <laughs> people were so like confused about this whole new thing, but it just meant, you know, a ton of distortion, basically. <laughs> and um, that was pop. But at the same time, I think even in this podcast, we haven't necessarily called Nirvana grunge. We've called them like punk or whatever. And so I just I mentioned this because, you know, the whole genre thing is can be kind of a, a baggage thing when you try to classify like if it's melodic enough, does it count as pop? Or, you know, what? How, what's the quotient of, you know, melodies that make something pop? Um, like with this Knack story, I mean, I one of the things I said about it is that they were kind of a new wave, like they set new wave off into motion. And I think a lot of people push back against that when we published the story. And they're like, the Knack isn't new wave. And I'm like, well, I know, I know they're not, you know, cars by, <laughs> you know, Gary Newman, but like they set that off in motion, right? And I guess that's a long way of saying the Knack was in that space between new wave like in a mainstream way but also they were still actively trying to be influenced by like the beatles which you know was 10 years before them so it's just an ever-evolving conversation i guess about what even a melody can, what counts as a melody <laughs> now that we're thinking about it i think that uh, people it's impossible that people can listen to the same type of music the entire life, your entire life is impossible. Yeah. I think that if you call yourself punk, uh, of course, that you need at least to interpret what pop says or what, you know, other type of music are saying. And um, Janice was mentioning Vaseline. And I was also thinking about Shawning Knife or um, also the raincoats that were a big influence for the Marine Girls. And I th- I'm still thinking about that. We have to thank all the female friends that Kurt Cobain mm. <laughs> had yeah. in his life. Yes. Because Amen. They, yeah, exactly. They brought that sensibility different. I don't want to say that uh, women makes music with sensibility. I don't want to say that. But in a way, it is different. And, and I think that um, Kurt was open for those type of different sensibilities. And I I think that he did a great mix. I don't know you, but I mean, I grew up listening to different type of things. Of course, that I love punk, that I fell in love with punk and rock. 
you are como my punk icon, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Being honest, I Thank mean, you for that. yeah, that's a great honor. But but I mean, you are a, a fan of I don't know Beatles or older classics, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I think that also it's in a generational context, people were placed in boxes more than they are now. Because with the advent of file sharing and now streaming, you can listen to anything you want at any time. And back in the day, it wasn't like that. Like, you listen to punk or you listen to pop or you listen to rap or you listen to jazz. And the people who kind of crossed over between things were either kind of praised as being cosmopolitan or they were made fun of for being weird and liking weird, different stuff. Mm -hmm. And Kurt is definitely a part of that generation where people were kind of boxed in by the music that they liked. And it's cool to progress to this generation where listening to all types of music is the standard because Kurt was one of those people that was seen as cool and unusual because he liked a lot of different types of music. Absolutely. As an anecdote, like I was in a, in high school, I was in a grunge band briefly. <laughs> what? <laughs> grunge really? influenced. <laughs> yeah. Do um, you remember the name of your band? I do. And Nirvana fans will appreciate that. We were called Ed, Ted and Fred, which is a name that Nirvana used oh. as like a <laughs> do, secret name. Yeah. Do you have something on YouTube? Please no. play it now. No. <laughs> thankfully. thankfully MySpace no. or something? Oh my MySpace, God. MySpace, all that got lost. Thank God. I was, I was the bass player. Dude, um, I became a bass player because my friends needed a bass. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was just like I, I owned a bass, so it was like you're going to be the bass player. I, I got, anyway, long story. <laughs> but I remember we were like trying to record in my buddy's basement, and he was the lead singer, and it, there was just there was no real melody to the song, and we were definitely ripping Nirvana. <laughs> and I tried to talk with him, be like, "Hey, man, can we like?" have a melody like and they're just like no no that's not punk it's not punk <laughs> like that's that's not what like kurt would be rolling you know i'm like i don't think I... so like, <laughs> and 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 i've 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 run across that sort of conversation a few times in like a punk band and stuff of like it's we are against pop music we are the antithesis wow. but melody does melody can be punk? Like you, you like I think some of the absolutely. Best, yeah, some of the best songs are the songs you want to chant and sing along to. So I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Like defining what we even mean by melody, like it doesn't have to be a jaunty like, oh, I'm going to snap my fingers and whistle down the street. But you know, when you say melody, Dusty, in that context, even with punk, you just mean something that's like, oh, I can easily remember, and when it comes time to sing it or to like recall the song, it's like it goes yeah. like this, like. I shouldn't do that. But um, <laughs> that was come as you are, if you didn't know. Um, whereas what you're saying, Dusty, in your band, sounds like your singer was like, no, punk is just, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, we're jamming yeah. on this one note and it's just this chunky chord. And it's right. like, but, but that's not Nirvana, you know? I should add, that was my last day in the band. Oh my God. <laughs> I was let go after that. But I, 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 so yeah, the definition. Creative differences. <laughs> yeah. The official meaning of melody is melody refers to a sequence of musical notes that are perceived as a single entity. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, that's what I was getting ready to say is that all, not just pop music, but all popular music has melody. I mean, you could go through any genre. You know, we're talking about punk specifically. I keep thinking about Fugazi's Waiting Room because it's my fiance's go-to karaoke song now. Oh. And how, how Waiting Room has such a great melody. And yes, it's a punk song too. Like yeah. there's... I think melody is the bedrock of what we now refer to as popular music, as, you know, just contemporary music in general. Like, every song has a melody to a degree. I mean, unless it's just some mess that... <laughs> Check out Ed, Ted, and Fred. 
Um, Martin, as you're talking about, like, it makes me think about White Wipers has melodies, you know? Uh, oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That's the band that came to mind when Dusty's friend was saying, you know, melody isn't punk. Wipers first came to mind. Exactly. Yeah, and both in the guitars and in the vocals. Oh, like, totally. Yeah. And I, yeah, I feel very strongly about the idea that most music that people like have melodies and so i don't think it's beholden to genre or style agreed yeah and it makes me think about you know i did the episode on rem and th- th- i think that this idea that you have to be apart from the popular conversation to to hold to like a punk value I, rem really speaks to that and I, I think that you know i think their music was always catchy like even murmur, you don't know what the hell he's saying, but like <laughs> it gets caught in your head. Oh yeah, um, I thought that it was my ling- <laughs> my no. language barrier. You know, and <laughs> good yeah. to know that everyone was thinking the same. <laughs> yeah. It's a Michael Stipe barrier <laughs> for sure. Um, but but yeah, and obviously they were such a model for Kurt of like how to do it right, you know. And they have incredibly catchy songs, mm-hmm. and so you can be catchy and not have to like deny yourself at the same time. Mm-hmm. But I also think that with R.E.M., it was something else, like beyond music. I think that they managed the success in a very different way. I think that is one of the reason of the big friendship with Kurt Cobain, you know, yeah. like that that kind of icon, that artist that you can always call, you know, to to share how overwhelmed <laughs> the the success can be. Yeah. I think Michael Stipe and Kurt Cobain, that relationship is just so like, I got, I got really emotional, like thinking about it, working on that episode and like details I hadn't even known. And just like, I was just so glad that he had Michael as someone to talk to. 100%. And, yeah. yeah. Like a role model. Like that's, and he's still that for a lot of people, but yeah. Like how do you like creating success on your own terms? Like being able to jump from being an indie star to like a mainstream label while like being true to your art. Uh, that's especially in this punk scene where like, you know, he might have butted heads with people like in Olympia or it's like, it's selling out to do anything that's going to be mainstream successful. Yeah. It was proof that you could do it. When you talk about REM's kind of version of success, I guess if you want to put it that way from indie to major label. Um, one thing I know you guys talked about in the episode after the knack was that they were kind of a one-hit wonder. <laughs> I mean, you made, made a joke about, like, what are any of the other songs off of their debut album? <laughs> it's, it's not <laughs> The Monkey and Me, you know, Siamese Twins or whatever. It, um, I mean, honestly, we we did that episode very recently, and I still can't remember any other songs <laughs> except for my Yeah, I mean, you know, and there are some good songs. On, like, like Let Me Out is a great opening song. Again, it, I'm not saying it's not a, not a good album. In this documentary I was watching um, on YouTube, there were the guitarist was saying like they just had so much pressure to create another my sharona like everyone everyone around them and even internally they were just like how and when can we ever (laughs) recreate that and so how do you top something that you did that was just like i don't want to say it was like perfect in general like uh, oh you know it's not like objectively the one of the best songs ever but like you know it caught on and like how do you it was a huge hit how do you find that sauce again it's like i think the sauce is transitive you know it's like transitory you just kind of be in the moment with it and say cool we did that they didn't want to create another my sharona that's the other thing too they were very proud of that song but sometimes you just got to be with the sauce when it's there and then it's gone and that's okay I want to say something like a bit controversial about mm. like uh, <laughs> controversy. No, I want to say that maybe they didn't want to recreate another My Sharona, but maybe yes. I don't know. I think that they were trying to follow the same outcome. I think, and I think that I don't know. It's an artistic decision. It's exactly about what do you want with your art. You know, maybe some some artists they. They don't care about what is going to happen in the next album. And some artists feel that pressure all the time to try to be better and better. And that is something about, I don't know. No, no, I think that's actually, I, I don't think that's controversial at all. I mean, I think that's actually like, I think that's right. I think you're right. They they were probably trying to catch on in a big way. But like, I, I think what you, something you said made me think of like, I don't think that musicians necessarily choose 
when they write a hit or when they're popular like this gets into like the muse comes to you and like tells you like when you've made a hit you know i don't i don't know if you can formulate like in a scientific way like well my show has this 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 and therefore like if we do this 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 you know what i mean yeah well it's sort of interesting because you know in the knack episode you talk about how the knack kind of had this tendency to write songs about women with the woman's name in the song title and how they were horny for that woman. <laughs> so they kind of did have a formula. They were a little formula. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, they were. And what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is like, despite their formula for like, oh, me horny, me right song. <laughs> uh, despite that formula, they couldn't get a hit out, out, other than through My Sharona. Yeah. And so that's, that's what I'm saying. There's some other, yeah. some other math behind the scenes that, you know, God is doing that's like, okay, this it was lightning in a bottle <laughs> this horny song is the one that's going to make it i will say about the knack and like chasing another hit that having a hit single is attractive like <laughs> like you know there's a certain dopamine rush when you have that notoriety that success that money And of course you would want to chase that again once you get it. It's like a high of sorts, you know, once you get that high, you're chasing the next high. And then there's the opposite end of it too, where there's the bands who run away from their hits. Like Smells Like Teen Spirit, like Mm -hmm. they were actively like avoiding that song and even uh, Serve the Servants on a Utero feels like a direct response. Like Teenage Jinx has paid off well. You yeah, know, uh, Radiohead creep is another big one, or mm-hmm. or bands who don't ever have another hit, and they're just like, oh man, I gotta play this song for the rest of my life. <laughs> but they, you just mentioned bands that they weren't singing about menor de edad, like mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> young girls, <laughs> yeah. and I think that you can. Sorry to mention that, but yeah. I think that you can feel different personalities mm-hmm. there. You know. W- w- what are you talking about on your art? You know, yeah. what is the, what the success means to you? You know, it's come on. Yeah, of course, that to have like a very successful single is wow, is super powerful. But at the same time, much Sharona, I mean, Sharona didn't even know that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that he composed a song about <laughs> I mean, her. So, yeah. consentimiento. I mean, yeah, where is it? can you imagine <laughs> that happening? Like, that's that was my big takeaway from the talking about my Sharona. It was like, you know, sure, it happened in, what, 1979 or whatever it was. Like, you know, that's just what people were doing, right? <laughs> um, they were just being horny and weird about, you know, like, oh, this girl is really hot. I'd love to get with her. I'm going to write a song about her. And she's going to hear it on the radio. Like, can you imagine, like, you would get canceled, I feel like, if you did that, you know? Yeah, like, yeah that wouldn't happen today. <laughs> why, don't, why not just go the Weird Al route and write about lunch meat? Because he took my Sharona, the melody and everything, and he was like, baloney like you know and and that <laughs> so i just wanted i had to make sure i get a shout out to weird al in in this round table because he not only <laughs> covered my <laughs> or not, not only parodied the knack with my bologna but he also did as dusty mentioned rem's spam for uh what song was that dusty stand stand yes for a stand so uh <laughs> so weird, shout out to weird al who makes a living on one hit wonders from other people and um re- rewrites them to be largely apparently about lunch meat also it takes an extreme level of talent to parody these songs with the high quality that weird al does i mean i feel like we've alluded to weird al a couple times on this series (laughs) and i just want to i just want to single out his talent for Mm -hmm. making these parodies so well that you can't help but remember them. And again, you know, it's a big, a big part of like the memory of melody. To be parodied mm-hmm. by Weird Al is to be canonized into history. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know who else Weird Al covered was Nirvana. That's right. Yep. Mm-hmm. Smells like Nirvana. Oh, yeah. I saw him perform at the State Fair. I was a huge Weird Al fan as a kid. That was my original career aspiration was to be the next Weird Al. Um, (laughs) It didn't didn't pan out. But I remember watching him play Smells Like Nirvana. And he was dressed like Kurt. And I was like, this is the closest I'll ever get to seeing Nirvana. (laughs) You said it was at the State Fair? Yeah, Puyallup State Fair. Shout out to the Puyallup State Fair. Do the Puyallup. 
I wonder if it's worth mentioning too, because so we talked about REM and, and the NAC, right? The ways they're successful, like REM being, you know, kind of indie to major and the NAC as the one hit wonder. And Janice, if you like, tell us about like Marine Girls. Yeah, yeah. You know, Marine Girls themselves obviously didn't have anything close to like a, a top 10 hit. But, you know, the band that Tracy Thorne formed with her boyfriend during the, the Marine Girls days uh, was um, Everything But the Girl. And in the 90s, they had not a number one hit, but it was like a number two in America hit with the song Missing. And that just, you know, exploded them into the stratosphere. And I feel like Tracy kind of had like a similar reaction to the spotlight that like Kurt had where, you know, they got invited to open for you too on tour. And she just, you know, imagined like being in the Midwest and being in like this enormous stadium and trying to sing Missing and just like, you know, was like, you know what? I think I'm I think it's time for a break. And that's kind of when everything but the girl sort of took a little bit of a hiatus. And and she and her partner in life and everything but the girl, they started having kids instead. And so she really like, you know, the idea of I guess you could kind of consider them a one hit wonder in the sense that like everything but the girl haven't had like a billboard top 10 hit since then. Um, but the, you know, they've definitely continued to record music. And I think it's like on the level that she's comfortable with. I think that what you're trying to say is that having kids is the most punk thing you can do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh. Tell them about it, Dusty. <laughs> kids are definitely punk. They have a lot of issues with authority. I mean, Una is total punk. Everything is no. Like, I'll be like, oh, you're so cute. She goes, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> yes, girl. I love it. <laughs> Going back to uh, the subject of Tracy Thorne, I think that the kind of cult status of Marine Girls is a form of success in its own way, because mm -hmm. even though, like you mentioned, Janice, uh, they didn't come close to even a sniff at a number one hit, they still have bands cover their songs to this day and i think that to me personally i feel as though it's almost cooler to be in a band where somebody you know in brighton where i believe two of the members of marine girls still live to this day will walk up to you and say hey weren't you in marine girls like i think that's <laughs> To me, that would be cooler than having a number one hit and essentially being a one hit wonder. It may not be quite as cool as having the the career of R.E.M., but it is success in its own terms. Definitely. And big shout out again to everything but the girl. Like what an like Marine Girls and everything but the girl, like that there that success to me, just that that catalog and work is just so Excellent. And it just the accolades kind of are irrelevant to like just how great those bands are. Yeah, I think um, you know, success is um success is what you make of it. it I feel like that sounded like a cliche as it left my mouth, but <laughs> I'm gonna stand with it. It felt it felt true. I could edit that out, Martin, but maybe I won't. <laughs> <laughs> nah, you could leave it in. That's good. I like it. So yeah, as we're winding down, I think it would be interesting to explore how we hear these bands, The Knack, R.E.M., and Marine Girls, in the music of Nirvana. I think the thing that comes jumps to mind for me with The Knack is particularly in the song Scoff, which almost takes it very direct inspiration of like the drum beat and the, the melody, which goes... Do, 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 But my Sharona is a do, 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 do. Like, it's just like, to me, it's like, those are pretty similar. I'll, I'll stop doing that. Um, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. So it, to me, it's like, that's one of those subtle, like Dusty, like you and your band trying to be like Nirvana, you know, I think it's similar to Nirvana probably in some ways was because they were listening to my Sharona when they were like preteens. 
um, I think it just like seeps into the subconscious and it's like, oh yeah, that really worked. That's really cool. I don't think they ripped off the knack, but you can definitely hear how like, oh, they grew up with that sound. And I think that just comes out um, in their music. And again, really respecting Kurt for like taking the melody and leaving the like, oh, girls are so hot mentality in the lyrics and just kind of singing about the opposite. I mean, feminism and uplifting, just like we've talked about earlier in this podcast. So that's my, my knack take there. If you heard the episode seven of El Cancionero Kurt, we started talking about about a girl and come as you are uh, as two examples of how can we see these three albums in Nirvana's music. But um, I think that <laughs> never mind the album is a great example about all these elements together. Uh, and again, I think that. Uh, Nirvana became like a super massive and popular. Yes, because it was a different moment in the music industry. But at the same time, I think that is because uh, they were playing music that combines all these different elements with super strong melodies. And I think that that album represents very well what we are talking about. And we're going to talk about this album in a couple of weeks. I think that's awesome, Albina. And I agree. Like, kind of go back to what I said at the beginning. Like, I think, never mind, like you're saying, is a pop album. It just happens to be really noisy. And I think that's, to me, what good pop music does and I, is that it connects with you on, like, a personal level. It's a, it's a, a story that everyone can relate to, like, popular in, in the title itself. So whether that's the emotional candidness of Marine Girls or R.E.M., like... Who knows what they're saying, but, you know, you feel it. Um, um, but uh, although they got the green, you, it was more intelligible. But there, there's a, something relatable, even the knack in their, you know, promiscuity, that that's relatable <laughs> on a level to, for, for people. Promiscuity of the knack. Um, yeah, I don't want to cut I myself off there. Promiscuidad. Yeah. <laughs> Is there something for everyone to find, like, on, on a mainstream level in all these things, no matter what sound they take? Yeah. I agree with that. As someone who is newly re-obsessed with Marine Girls, I hear a lot of the teenage heartbreak in that band, that, that teenage sense of heartbreak in both the music of Marine Girls and a lot of Nirvana songs, particularly about a girl and you know, a handful of songs from Nevermind. Yeah, no, I think <laughs> Martin took what I was going to say, but I mean, he said it so eloquently <laughs> that it's like, yeah, all I can say is totally. <laughs> Time to get out of here. Thank you to Albina. Please go listen to El Cancionero de Kurt or do what I do and watch it on YouTube with the English subtitles because I'm not quite fluent in Spanish yet. Yay! I love that. I love that you're doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Martin, we got to do a friend quest on Duolingo. Or something. Yeah, I know. We should. And thank you to Janice Headley, also co-host of In Our Headphones podcast, digital design manager and indie pop scholar extraordinaire. Thank you for Aww. being here. And thanks to Roddy for all of your audio production work, your mixing, and writing this episode for The Knack. That's what I do. And spiritually here is Isabel Khalili, our podcast manager, and Larry Mizell Jr., our director of editorial. I'm Dusty Henry. And I'm Martin Douglas. This is the Cobain 50 from Listener Powered KEXP. Cool. Well. <laughs> <laughs> My shit on <laughs>